Hi everyone, we are in video two for our developing IEP goals with standards in mind. And we are coming to the section of the training where we're looking at adverse effect. So on this slide and then the next two slides, I have some examples for you that you might want to look at with some um, sample present levels information. So I'd love for you to take a few minutes to look through and see if you see current data see if you see positive statements of student strengths, and then see if you can identify the adverse effect statement. I've got a second example here for you to um, check out. And again, these are just samples for you to do a little practice with. I am going to walk you through what I consider to be a gold level standard when it comes to adverse effects statement. And so you'll see in the top um, smaller text, the actual language that was in Addison's um, present levels. And then underneath in the larger text, I have broken this down into its components and we'll talk about why this is a brilliant adverse effect statement. And I said earlier in the uh, first video that this statement can be so powerful that I equated it to a present, right? That it can be absolutely something that makes a difference in how we think about the IEP. So if your adverse effect statement starts with the student's name, so it started with Addison's and it said deficits in, and then in red, it said math calculation and math reasoning. These are the areas of eligibility for Addison. So key parts here, because that's where we want to know where Addison is struggling. So Addison's deficits in math calculation and math reasoning, including the and then I've got some um, bluish green words that are highlighted in a pinkish color in the ordering of fractions and solving multi-step word problems. This is the Kentucky Academic Standards for Addison's grade level. And they were the key parts of the standards uh, according to the conversation the special ed teacher had with a gen ed teacher. And they said, you know, based on what Addison is able to do right now, you know, what's really going to impact him is that he's not able to order fractions or solve solve multi-step word problems, right? So they added those words negatively affect his progress in the general math curriculum at the level and pace of same age peers. If you stopped there, I would call this a C minus because you have included areas of eligibility and you've said what Addison isn't able to do. But what's missing is why can't Addison do that and why the why, why, why is what we need to understand to choose the skills and strategies we're going to use to help Addison make progress. So here is where we get to the gold level. The second sentence, Addison's lack of understanding beyond concrete representations will continue to perpetuate the gap between Addison and his same age peers. So specifically stating the skill or strategy that are keeping Addison from making progress is crucial in this adverse effect statement. You want to make sure your adverse effect statement is that bow at the top of the present levels, right? I mean, it makes the whole present levels make sense. It's the aha moment in the present levels that says, okay, so Addison is currently able to do X and Y and Z, and you've got very clear data there. But here's the reason that this is important. This is what's keeping Addison from making progress. Um, this is all about knowing the grade level standards and knowing where this student is not able to access the curriculum and the why um, is part of our adverse effect statement. Now, as we are working on the IEP in a logical sequential order, making our way through, uh, we are coming to the next section, which is considerations of special factors. And it's really important that we transition um, this section in our mind because considerations of special factors is all about our focus on supporting the students. What other areas might our students need support? And the NDRF ruling was very clear that we have to consider you know, that whole child. So when you're looking at considerations of special factors, I've got a big orange arrow here that I'd like you to really hone in and highlight and circle this section. When you're looking at the very first question 
um, on Kentucky IEPs for considerations of special factors. The first question deals with behavior. And note the arrow is pointing to the sentence that says, this question about behavior applies to students with any category of disability any category. It does not matter if it's specific learning disability, OHI, EBD, whatever the category. If they have a behavior that's impeding their learning, we need to consider that. Then there's a whole series of guiding questions that we should use to think about what is impacting this student. Do they have some behaviors that are different than their same age peers? It does not matter if those behaviors are acting out behaviors or if those are behaviors where our students shut down. Um, whatever that behavior might be, if it's impeding their learning, we need to think about it. The requirement here is that we do something if their behavior is impeding their learning. It does not have to be an FBA. You'll notice the sentence says strategies may include an functional behavioral assessment and a behavior intervention plan, behavior contract, or social skills as appropriate. So you do have to use some positive behavior interventions, but it doesn't necessarily have to be an FBA. If you don't know why a student's behavior is impacting their learning, then you definitely as an IEP team would want to consider if you need to have an FBA to figure out why the behavior is happening. But if you know why the behavior is happening and you know that there is something that you can do, whether it's specially designed instruction or supplementary aids and services, if there's something that you can do, then you want to address that in the IEP and in your conference summary notes. So when we get to this question, I'm going to just chat for a minute, you know, teacher to teacher, and let's talk about what happens at this box. So here we are, <clears throat> and we've talked about present levels, then we start with this question. And the question itself, I think, sometimes leads us down a wrong path. The question says, does the child's behavior impede his or her learning or that of others? And sometimes I think what happens if we're thinking about like the, the, the thoughts behind our heads um, is people look at this question and they see this question as a question of judgment, right? If you check yes, you're saying bad kid, rotten kid. That's not what this question is about at all, right? Does the child's behavior impede his or her learning? It just means, is there something that this child is doing that's keeping them from being able to learn or other kids from being able to learn? When I'm talking with parents about this sentence, I really frame this as this is a section for support. You know, so Sarah has some behavior that are slowing down her learning or stopping her for learning. And we'd like to support her with some strategies um, in specially designed instruction. And that's why we're going to mark yes. <coughs> I um, had a fantastic group of students one year, and we had a wide variety of needs within this group, um, but it was my reading group. And you know, I was a new teacher and I was really proud of myself. I had planned a beautiful lesson. I just walk with me for a second here and, and, and feel the glory, all right? So the lesson was the CH sound, and it was cha-cha-cha, and I'd found a gorgeous anchor image. I thought it was adorable for my second graders. It was a chimp, and he had a banana in his mouth, and it was a CH sound, and I thought I was just gloriously brilliant. And we made it um, about 15 minutes into the lesson, and John flipped over his chair and said... I hate you and your effing CH sound and your effing chimp. I patted myself on the back and I said to myself, Laura, good job. John has the anchor image. He knew the CH sound went with chimp. I'm, I'm doing a good job here. And in my head, I thought he's following the behavior plan. We're doing good, Laura. Doing good. Great day. Great day. I'm going to have a Dr. Pepper when I leave work today yay for me. And so I looked over at Samantha and I thought to myself, oh, we are on a roll of greatness because Samantha has done nothing but smile at me through this whole lesson. And I said, Samantha, how are we doing? What are we learning today? And she said, 482 dots. And I said to myself, what? And I said, Samantha, honey, we're in reading class and we're working on a sound. What sound? And she said, there are 482 dots in the ceiling tiles. 
So while Samantha never once acted out or caused any disruption, her behavior impeded her learning way more than John's, and it was consistent over time. My progress monitoring data told me that she was making less progress than John. So in both John and Samantha's IEP meetings that came up, we reviewed their data and discussed if their behaviors were impeding their learning. For both students, uh, the IEP team decided that the answer was yes. Even though Samantha's behaviors um, were impacting her learning and she never disrupted class at all, um, her learning was very impeded by her behavior and she needed some significant specially designed instruction and supplementary aids and services and self-monitoring strategies to stay on task during the lesson. So that was what we considered here in this area of special factors. So no matter whether your student is flipping a desk or very sad and needs adult support and tension, um, whether they need some interventions, we want to consider that carefully. As you work through considerations of special factors, make sure that you as a team are really talking through anything that might be impacting the student's ability to make access in the curriculum specific to the areas listed under considerations for special factors. So, dun dun dun, we are moving on to measurable annual goals. And when we move on to measurable annual goals, we've talked in video one all about rock climbing and making sure that that IEP is like a rope and we're connecting every part. Another way we can think about that are links in a chain. We want a really strong chain that's going to support our students' access to the curriculum. And we want to make sure that each part, from present levels to measurable annual goals to progress monitoring, that those links in the chain are all connected together and make logical sense. In the compliance record review document, we've already talked about the fact that the measurable annual goals have to have a clear connection to the present levels. We also know that the next part of the compliance record review document tells us that we have to have evidence of a progress, data collection, and analysis for each annual goal. And there are very specific things that are going to be looked for. <clears throat> In addition to the fact that our, we have to have data, it has to have a date in which the data was collected. It has to include um, some analysis of that data. So we want to make sure that we're scoring it, we're making notes on student progress, and that that is all um, collected and kept in whatever system our district requires us to keep our raw data and our cumulative graphs, that we are analyzing data carefully um, so that we're able to reflect on that in the IEP meetings. As you are looking at your data, I would encourage you to just pause here and think through your students' IEPs. Do you have those clear connections? And does your data have analysis for every goal for every student? On the measurable annual goals page, I would encourage you to highlight or circle like I have here some of the key statements. Um, a few things we need to remember when we're working on measurable annual goals. We definitely are acknowledging and understanding all of the content standards for that grade level, but that is not the purpose of the measurable annual goal. We're not taking the measurable annual goals. They're not just restating the content standards and putting the words John will in front of a content standard, but rather what we're doing with the content standards is breaking them down into the skills or strategies. Thinking back to that map analogy, you know, all the different places on the map to get to that vacation destination of the content standards. We're doing that. We're breaking down the content standards into skills and strategies and marking where our student is along the path with data. We know that the goals have to be in that second paragraph appropriately ambitious in light of the student's circumstances and their potential to grow or learn. So we want to make sure that we're looking at that appropriate growth and that needs to be a percent or a number that says if Sarah is at A, if she is at 20 words per minute at the beginning of the year, given her ability to learn her current circumstances, I think that this is an appropriate growth goal for her. 
The next paragraph has some key points for us about not just copying the annual goal from year to year and increasing the number. If a student hasn't mastered a goal, I like that where the arrow is pointing, then it, the goal may not be appropriate. So for example, for a student who is qualified in the area of reading fluency and we have a words per minute goal, the student might be making progress every year and we have a reason to, to continue to increase the complexity of the text, the number of words per minute. But for some students, maybe we need to consider that instead of a words per minute goal, maybe we're going to focus on decoding multisyllabic words, you know, taking a specific skill or strategy and using that the next year for a goal. Now, if I decide to move from words per minute to decoding multisyllabic words, then of course I will have to go ahead and collect baseline data before we meet, and I will have to have that, that progress monitoring system in place so that I am ready to share the data of where the student currently is, and then my plan for moving forward with progress monitoring data. Our focus with those measurable annual goals is always on bridging the gap from the students' present levels to where we want them to be. And a key part um, in that bottom paragraph, the middle box, um, talks about avoiding multiple skill deficits in one goal. So we don't want to do what sometimes people call the fruit bowl effect in a goal where we're putting all different skills together. We want to break those apart into separate goals if we feel the need to tackle all those separate skills um, so that we're really able to hone in on the data and make sure we know if the student is making progress. The final section that is boxed in there is talking about the stranger test. And the stranger test is really crucial for goals because we want kids to be able to continue to make progress even if they move from district to district or school to school, state to state. So the measurable annual goal needs to be picked up and read by any other teacher or person and they could clearly see and understand exactly what is expected for that goal. So on our page where we've got an example to break down, I would encourage you to draw a picture here. And let me tell you what I'd like you to draw. What I'd like you to draw is a really simple stage. And then I'd like you to put a student in the middle of that stage. And the reason for that is this. When I'm thinking about the stranger test, I'm thinking about being able to see and reproduce the goal and being able to see and reproduce the progress monitoring system so that I can continue the student's um, learning. So in the gold example we have here, the um, audience is Mary. So my student is Mary and she's standing in the middle of the stage. And I am the director and I expect Mary to act a certain way. Um, that's her behavior, right? So Mary is on the stage and I'm going to ask her to orally define. So it's a stranger test. I'm like, okay, I understand that. She's going to say something. Okay. So then the circumstances are what I as the director or the teacher need to give Mary in order for her to be able to be successful on this stage. So it says the circumstances are when given 20 content related vocabulary words. So I give myself a check mark and I know, okay, I've got 20 cards in front of me and I'm going to hand those words to Mary. She's on the stage and she's going to orally define those words. So when I look at the data that came with Mary from her other school, it said that Mary was currently able to read, to orally define those words. And she was doing 15 out of 20 accurately. And she'd done that on three consecutive probes. So for me, the three consecutive probes, it says the goal is measured weekly. So I'm like, okay, I understand that. So for three weeks in a row, she read 15 words per minute. That's great. So when I gave Mary the 15, the 20 words to define, she only read four of them and defined them correctly. And I thought, what in the world? So I called Mary's teacher and I said, Mary's uh, not able to do this at all. I don't know what you did. And so the teacher said, well, did you give her the 20 content related vocabulary words? And I said, yes, they were on a card. I handed them right to her. And she said, well, didn't you put them on the graphic organizer? And I said, what graphic organizer? You didn't say there was a graphic organizer. And she said, well, I always give her one. Well, if she always gives her one and Mary requires that to be successful, then the circumstances should have said when given 20 content related vocabulary words and a graphic organizer, right? The circumstances have to have everything in it that Mary needs to be able to act out or perform the goal. 
we want to also make sure that our method of measurement is clear <coughs> so that I, as the teacher, know exactly what I have to have in front of me. So in this case, I have to have a checklist in front of me and I'm measuring it weekly. So you want to make sure that under the stranger test that everybody would understand exactly what you're going to have. And if it's something like a checklist that I am creating, then I would recommend as the best practice that you upload that checklist so that people can see exactly what that looks like. So the stranger test, if Mary goes to a new teacher, that that teacher has an example of what it looks like and they can move forward with her progress. If you're looking for a sample worksheet to develop goals, I've got one hyperlinked in in the orange section. If you head to the IEP goal development website that we chatted about in the other video, you will notice that all of the goals there are also set up in that same A through F formula. And we've also added some additional columns to give some examples of some specially designed instruction and supplementary aids and services that you might consider, as well as sometimes some program supports and modifications that you might consider as part of your process. The template that we've got here, um, it links in not just A through F, but as I just said, SDI and SAS. Um, the reason that we went ahead and developed this is that we felt that quite often when we were talking through developing the goal, we needed to go ahead and systematically plan out what specially designed instruction the student would need to make progress on the goal, and if any program supports were needed or supplementary aids and services. So as you're thinking through all the different things a student would need to be successful, it's good to kind of put those down at the same time. Um, in addition to that form, um, some of you might prefer to work in a different logic model. So we created this process that lets you do things um, in a kind of one, two, three fashion, where you are um, capturing that student's area of need or deficit, and then going ahead and finding the grade level standard that applies, and then looking through the skills and strategies that might keep that student from meeting their um, goals and then add the data and then start breaking down your goal. Um, this form also gives you an opportunity to think about all the other areas of the IEP that we've started talking about so that you've kind of captured that all on one form and can put it in the IEP. So let's talk about progress monitoring and thinking about how we're going to measure the goal. Um, we've talked about already the importance of this system being easy to collect and easy to analyze. We want to make sure that we're focused in tightly on that student making progress in their goals. Um, I use the example, we need to have an apples to apples to apples comparison when we're thinking about baseline data. Um, it doesn't do us any good to have words per minute and then a star score and then an and then an ABC chart on their behavior. Um, if we're looking at words per minute, then I need to look at words per minute every week. And as a compliance piece, if I am looking in a folder um, to look at your raw data, I'm expecting to see if it's a weekly data collection and we've had 20 weeks of school, I'm expecting to see 20 weeks of, of data. Um, so you want to make sure that you've got that all collected and that it is based on that system. Whatever you've said you're using to collect progress monitoring data, that's what you have ready to go. When I'm thinking about methods of measurement, I'm thinking about temperature checks. You know, temperature check is something that's very easy to collect. The data is easy to analyze over time because you're looking at a number that says exactly what your temperature is. And it's the same thing with uh, our methods of measurement. You know, we're not looking at um, collecting, you know, 50 pounds of data, um, 417 pieces of paper, because that's not easy to collect. And it's definitely not easy to analyze, where a temperature check is easy to collect and easy to analyze. If you look at the progress monitoring choices there for our methods of measurement, and um, we have those four big pieces, right, we can use curriculum based measurement, which look like oral reading fluency or math computation probes. Direct and indirect measures we frequently use when we're looking at behavioral data. 
And you'll notice that there are a few, like a checklist, that appear on both lists. So to clarify the differences between these two methods of measurement, a direct measure always means that I am watching the student the entire time that they are engaged in that behavior. So if I'm using a checklist um, to um, define for that Mary's example where she's orally defining words, then I am sitting with Mary listening to her orally define words and I'm checking off as she goes. If I'm using that as an indirect measure, maybe Mary is filling out a worksheet, then A, in the circumstances it needs to say given a worksheet and um, the checklist then becomes an indirect measure because I'm scoring it after Mary finishes the work. You'll note with authentic assessment that it can never be used alone and you have to choose a different method of measurement. So you might consider authentic assessment more as a tool to triangulate data over time where you're maybe collecting some writing samples over several weeks, um, but your weekly check uh, might be a direct or an indirect measure. It's super important to think about your method of measurement in terms of your standards based goals because you want to be thinking about what kind of method of measurement can I use that's going to help me see if a student is making progress towards those standards based IEPs. So as we think about those standards-based goals and looking at the academic standards, we also want to think about the role that specially designed instruction and supplementary aids and services um, play. <clears throat> and we want to make sure that we're choosing wisely. If we choose a specially designed instruction like explicit instruction, um, in letter sounds, then that's the expectation for teaching for that student for that goal. So however you are going to teach it, you need to list that as the specially designed instruction. I would not think of this as a um, virtual shopping cart where you're just going to throw in every um, possible way you could teach the skill, but rather what's the targeted intervention you're going to use to support the student. The same with supplementary aids and services. They need to be tied to the goals and um, how you're helping increase access to the content. Again, the rope needs to be solid and not broken. The links in your chain need to be connected. So if a student um, qualifies in the area of reading fluency, and then you have a calculator under supplementary aids and services, um, that doesn't, the chain's not connected. It doesn't make sense. So you need to make sure that what you have there makes sense that your specially designed instruction is very clearly um, specific to what the special education teacher is doing first and teaching. And then those supplementary aids and services are really targeted to what the student needs to be able to access the curriculum. If you'd like to dive deeper into SDI and SAS, we have a separate training um, just about helping students uh, target in on specially designed instruction uh, for their specific areas of need and also what supplementary aids and services you can use to support. When you are thinking about choosing supplementary aids and services, I'd like to encourage you to think about those as um, part of a pool. So this is one of my friend's pools and she's got a gorgeous pool. Don't you think it's in her backyard? I'm a little jealous. And um, this lovely pool for us is like the content standards. Most of us would just love to dive into this pool, but some of us don't swim well. Right. And so in order for me to get in this pool, I'm either going to just have to paddle my legs on the side or I'm going to have to cling to the ladder or I'm going to, have to hold on to the sides the whole time and I'm going to be miserable and I'm not going to want to be there. And I might splash people with my legs and I might have all kinds of acting out behaviors because I'm not comfortable in the pool. And the same is true for many of our kids who have skill deficits. They can't get in the pool and swim, so they might shut down in class or have acting out behaviors. So then we put supports in place, which are wonderful. And some of us put great supports in place so that everyone that is around them sees those supports and thinks, wow, that's kind of cool. I like what they've got. Others of us are throwing great big life rafts on kids. And then all of a sudden we have students that are saying, oh, I don't need a reader. No, no, I'm not going to go out and take a test. Uh, no, I don't need a quiet setting for that. I'm good. I'm good. I'm going to stay right here. 
and then they score an F or they say, Oh, I don't need a reader. I, I can read this myself. I got it. I got it. No reader for me. And they start refusing those supplementary aids and services. I'd like you to think of that as a possible life raft situation. Are we turning it into a life raft or are we making it a really cool float? When you're in a pool, and everybody has a really cool float, whether they can swim or not, they're diving around and they're sitting on a llama float. And then somebody else has a flamingo float and whether they can swim or not, people are hanging out in the floats and we're enjoying the water. The same can be true for our supplementary aids and services. We can make them um, part of our universally designed instruction for students where everyone can hang out in the pool together. So what does that look like? Well, that might look like for one student who needs adapted scissors, I have six pairs of adapted scissors in my scissor bucket with a ton of other scissors. And when it's time to cut, I say to kids, everybody grab some scissors. Um, for a student who needs a reader, I tell students, okay, there's three different ways that you can access the novel today. The war first way is to go to our Google Classroom, and I've got an audible reading of the textbook. You can definitely check it out there. Um, if you'd like, you can go ahead and put your earbuds in and listen to some music while you read the chapter, right? So everybody's got earbuds in, um, but some people could be listening to music. Some people are listening to the book. I'm not just saying, oh, John, if you'll check your email, you have a link and now you've got to go put your headphones on to hear the text. Making things as accessible as possible so that we're all swimming in the pool together. If you'd like to dive deeper into um, some different ways you can look at supplementary aids and services, I've got several different frameworks that are available. When you're thinking about what specially designed instruction you can use, KDE has given us this great lesson plan handbook that we can use. It is in a Word document. This document was produced in 2014, and we've got lots of new evidence-based practices that have risen to the top, especially in the area of behavior. So if you're looking to really hone in, I would encourage you to download this as a Word document, and then you can go in and highlight, um, starting on page 13, in the areas all the way from basic reading through um, math and writing and behavior, um, the specially designed instruction and supplementary aids and services most used by students at your grade level or age. And then um, that's a great resource you can use as you're developing IEPs and really looking at what's appropriate at this grade level based on the content standards. When we think about supporting our students, um, especially in the area of behavior and other supports that students might need, um, I would encourage us also to think about helping students organize. Um, often, if you think about our brains as this beautiful closet, which we would all probably love to have, um, this is how our brains um, ideally would function, like this closet. But what often happens for students with disabilities is no one has taught them the executive functioning skills they need to be able to organize um, their knowledge in a way that they can easily retrieve it. So everything's off of hangers and thrown on the floor in the middle of this lovely closet. So if we think of this closet like our brains and all of these hangers as the neural pathways that we're helping build, then we can help build hangers for our students by helping them organize their content knowledge. So sometimes under that specially designed instruction, what we're doing is helping them organize the hows of learning, the growth mindset they need to be successful successful. I'll give you a second to look at this picture and just kind of take in the whew, glory of this. For those of us that love books, this is kind of exciting. But even though I love books, this kind of, I'll just be honest, this kind of just makes me a little nervous. And for a lot of kids, this is what it feels like. Um, they feel like they're standing in this hallway all the time trying to retrieve the content knowledge and the behavioral expectations that we're throwing at them because we haven't cleared the way and the pathway and we're giving them a hundred tasks to do at one time instead of three targeted strategies or skills that they need to make progress towards the general academic content grade level standards we'd like them to get to. So I would encourage us to keep this visual in mind when we're thinking about developing IEPs and consider what presence can we give kids in this IEP 
that will help them make progress in a way that they can synthesize and organize the knowledge through those skills and strategies to make progress over time. For some of our students in the IEP, an underused area is program modifications and supports for school personnel, especially for students who have some behaviors that are impeding their learning. For example, students that are shutting down when they get frustrated and might need explicit instruction in growth mindset, and they might need some explicit instruction in mindfulness strategies. Um, that might not be knowledge that every teacher has. So we would need to, in program modifications and supports for school personnel, provide growth mindset and mindfulness strategies and awareness for all school personnel so that they can consistently use that language when they see our students start to shut down during a reading activity that is above their ability level. We're thinking through, going back to page six of the guidance document, that whole child and the Andrew F requirements that we include parents and that we analyze data to think about where students are and where students need to be. So we think about this area as ways that we can really increase our success across all school settings to all work together to ensure that that specially designed instruction and supplementary aids and services is working together to support our student in making progress. There are some great examples that are here that also include looking at medical needs and possible training for bus personnel, um, cafeteria staff, other instructional support that might need to be in place for our students. When we're thinking about our students' IEP and the goals that we are developing, we're looking at those standards-based goals, grade level appropriate, um, moving students forward. We also want to be thinking about the least restrictive environment. There's lots of different settings in which a student can learn, just like all of these beautiful doors that you see in front of you. We want to make sure that our student is in the right setting, that least restrictive environment, as much as possible so that they can continue to make progress. So as you're thinking through settings, there are times when it is appropriate for a student to be in a special class to learn a specific content. The important consideration that we need to continue to ask ourselves is, is this student being pulled into a smaller setting because that's what they need to make progress? And does that require 15 minutes of time or 40 minutes of time or an hour of time, but that we're scheduling those times based on the student's learning needs and not what we would call scheduling convenience. In other words, um, our school is set up in two hour blocks. And so I am gonna schedule John for a two hour block um, during second period because that's convenient for us and that way he's in there the whole time because Mrs. Smith doesn't like him to pop in and out of English class. So I'm just going to keep him in my class. I'm going to do 20 minutes of specially designed instruction and then he's going to work independently for the rest of the time. Um, that's a scheduling convenience that is not a least restrictive environment for that student. So the more appropriate setting in that case would probably be that he needs to be in Mrs. Smith's class. We need to provide maybe some program supports for Mrs. Smith to understand um, how to support John uh, when he comes and goes from her class so that he can still access the curriculum but also get that uh, specially designed instruction he needs in a resource setting. As we've talked through um, that IEP development and really thinking through grade level access and parent involvement, um, the special education, um, the case division, no, I'm sorry, wrong division, um, and the Council for Exceptional Children, the teacher education division called TED has a journal called TEAS, the Teacher Education Special Education, and they had a fantastic article in 2019 about facilitated IEP program meeting. And so <clears throat> I um, took that tool and modified it a little bit. If you'd like to read the entire article, I would encourage you to grab that journal issue. Um, when you're thinking about meeting with families, this facilitated 
IEP process can really be helpful to ensure that the family feels that they are an active part, but also help keep our meetings um, on target and on goal because our purpose is to develop an IEP that will help that student make progress. So this handout is linked in there for you and gives some great ideas for keeping your meeting forward, meeting moving forward. I had mentioned at the beginning of the training this fantastic issue of teaching exceptional children, and I wanted just to share a few big ideas that came out of this article, these articles for me, um, just to share yeah, some, some thoughts that you might want to consider when you're looking at IEP development. We know that there's no one size fits all. We're not looking at, you know, for fifth grade, we're going to all target this reading standard and, and X math standard. And, and this is what we're going to do. And all IEP goals will look a certain way. We're looking at that style's, child's individual data and making decisions based on that. We also know that we're really looking at that continuum of services and making sure we're in the gen ed setting as much as possible and that we're making our decisions um, based on what the student's data is telling us. We're not making decisions based on their area of eligibility, um, but we are really thinking through where's the best place for this student to learn. There were some excellent questions in figure four for determining appropriate placement. So if you um, haven't really thought that through, I would encourage you to check out figure four and again, um, go back to the journal and pull out that article. We for sure want to make sure that we're always thinking through that continuum of placement and that we're not even thinking about placement until after the IEP is developed and we've talked through that student's present levels and their current needs. We definitely want to use supplementary aids and services to support students in that least restrictive environment before we think about moving to another setting. And we want to make sure that that placement is individualized based on the student's needs, not on any diagnosis or area of eligibility. We know that for students, their IEP, I, I liked the analogy, it's the vehicle by which the content um, is going to be formulated and delivered. So when you're thinking about that free and appropriate public education, your student's IEP is going to be what propels the student forward. If you look at the words that are in white, um, it's really focusing in on the fact that the key to the IEP is that it is the document that helps us appropriately scaffold the student's IEP or the student's program so that they're going to make progress. So before we say what definitely to do, let's talk about things we should just never do. Um, these are things that people have done in the past that are just big no-nos. Um, people, if you have a meeting and don't obtain parent permission, um, that's a huge no-no. If you don't have all the required components in the IEP, another big no-no. Um, if you do not involve the parents in making decisions or in permissions, ugh, big no-nos. If you don't follow the timeline, another no-no. And definitely determining the student's placement before the IEP is developed. Um, we also know that huge no-nos are not addressing all of the students' needs or missing parts of the IEP, not including goals or not including uh, providing the key services. Um, if we ignore students' behavior problems, if our goals are not measurable, <laughs> and if we are not educating students in the least restrictive environment, these are all violations that we do not want to have in our IEPs. What we do want to do is make sure that we have an IEP that the team agrees is reasonably calculated for the student to make progress, that we've come to the table and our conference summary notes reflect that we had an open mind and that we discussed and made data-driven decisions and that we looked at and honored those procedural safeguards um, to support the family. There are lots of great implications for the two key rulings, the Rowley Court ruling and the Andrew F. ruling, um, that we want to make sure that we are doing to, for students to be successful. One is that we're following all of our state procedures and all of our district procedures for students with disabilities. 
Uh, two, that we are meaningfully engaging parents. Three, that the assessments that we have provided and that we are discussing in the meeting are relevant to the student's needs and that they address all of the student's needs. Remember that behavior component. That the IEP, the measurable annual goals, are deemed to be ambitious challenging and meaningful. Remember, we're thinking about that Polynesian vacation, that, which is the grade level standards, and that we're moving students no matter what their current abilities are. Are we moving them towards grade level understanding in a way that's appropriate for them? Are we using evidence-based programming? In other words, peer-reviewed literature to make decisions. We're looking at things like evident, explicit instruction um, to move students forward. And that we're really thinking about the student's circumstances when we're crafting that IEP. We know that we must monitor student progress. It has to be a systematic formula and we have to be in compliance with our state guidelines. We also need to make sure that if a student is not making progress, that we are meeting as an IEP team and we are making instructional changes. We're not just admiring the problem, but rather making changes. We also want to make sure that we're justifying the student's IEP, <laughs> that it makes sense, right? That what we are documenting it's a clear, persuasive, and responsive explanation, right? So that people could pick this up and that stranger test applies. You understand, yes, okay, I see that. They said this student is currently here, but here's what's going on in their lives. And so this is why the team made the decision that they made. I hope you've enjoyed this overview look at the quick tips for building an IEP focused on the state standards. The final video that we have for this training is a quick dive into the IEP goals website so that you can look at those sample goals. And also um, you've got access to that site so that you can take your personal dive into the areas where you have students with goals um, in those areas. I have so enjoyed sharing with you and I hope that you will reach out to me with any questions that you have. If you'd like to learn further, um, I've got some great resources here and I've also linked in information about um, the pictures and images that I used. Thank you for learning with me today and I hope you enjoy the rest of our journey in developing IEPs.